joy to share in this time with all of you. We are the gathered community. We have folks worshiping from Beverly, from the North Shore, and from several parts of our country. We have several states represented this day in worship, and we have folks worshiping with us from Nicaragua, where this congregation has a partnership with Amos Health and Hope, which provides essential health services to the most vulnerable in one of the poorest countries in the Western Hemisphere. So wherever you are sitting, wherever you are worshiping from, welcome. Jesus says where two or three are gathered, there I am also. So Jesus is in the house with us. I've been on vacation for about three weeks and it is so good to be back with you. A highlight was having our daughter, Caitlin, uh, spend a week with us from Iowa. We all got tested and so we had a chance to uh, just be with one another and just savor the gift of being family. And I know that that is one of the gifts uh, and one of the longings of many of us during this pandemic, to be able to gather with family and friends in safety. And that day will come. But here we are as the church right here, right now, and it is so good to have us together. Sharing with me in worship this day is my colleague, the Reverend Julie Flowers, and our music director, Dr. Esther Chang, who will be introducing a musical guest later on in the worship service. Our invocation and Lord's Prayer will be led by members of the Constantine family, Dave, Pam, and Adam. Our scripture will be read by members of the Sykes family, Abby, Josie, and Amos. Our stepsitters, which is our children's story, will be brought by Lisa LaPlante. So we're so glad that you can be with us this day, and this is a communion Sunday. And so I invite you to go to your cupboard and grab some bread, uh, some hot dog or hamburger, buns and rolls, or uh, a cracker, and bring that to the communion table and a favorite beverage. And later on in the service, these, these elements will be brought together in the sacred ritual of the breaking of the bread and the sharing of the cup. This is also Labor Day weekend Sunday, and we think of all those and give thanks for those who labor for the common good. We think of, of the vision of this country and we long for the day when people can have an affordable wage and, and provide for themselves and for their households with one job, with good benefits. We're not nearly there yet, but we hope to, and we, and we shoot and we long for that goal 
We think of people who are unemployed, people who have been furloughed. We think of small business owners who are worrying about the future. And we pray a blessing and encouragement upon all of these good folk. And we think of the many who volunteer their services for the common good. We give thanks on this Labor Day Sunday for all the good work that people do and that all may be blessed. So now we enter into worship as Dr. Esther Chang leads us in one of the great hymns of the church. Constantine. I'm Dave. I'm Pam. I'm Adam, and this is Lego. As you can see, we're missing Peter and Kara, but that's because they're not part of our quarantine bubble. Um, as you can see, we're standing in the woods. This is actually a path that we've discovered. Uh, we used to walk by these woods all the time and never really thought about them uh, until quarantine gave us the opportunity to really explore what was right around our own house. Uh, and we found all these amazing paths through the woods. And so now it's kind of a daily tradition that after work, we all pack up our things and take Lego out for a walk around these woods paths. Um, today, we're going to be presenting to you the invocation as well as the Lord's Prayer. Um, in our tradition, we say debts instead of, uh, instead of trespassers. But if you're used to saying trespassers, that's fine. You can say whatever you want. Gracious and loving God of hope, we thank you for the beautiful days of summer, even as we recognize the occasional cool air that heralds the coming fall. We thank you for your inspiration as we learn not to just adjust to our COVID circumstances, but to think differently, to create a better world. We thank you for the gift of spending more time with those on our quarantine, even as we feel the pain of separation from others whom we love and miss. We are grateful for your sympathetic embrace of parents, children, and teachers as the school year begins and they all do their very best to make it work. We are grateful for your loving embrace of those who are sick and also for their families. We are thankful for your supportive embrace of those who face economic and social distress. Let us be your earthly hands to help. And always, 
always, we are grateful that you loved us enough to send your son to teach us how to live, to love, and to pray, saying, oh, Our Father, Father, who art in heaven, heaven hallowed, hallowed be thy name. name. Thy the kingdom come, come thy will, will be done, done on earth as it is in heaven. heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Today's passage, 1 John 4 through 7 and 18 through 21, is attributed to the Apostle John. John reflects on Jesus as the embodiment of God's love and how love can change the human heart and change the course of the world. John reminds us that the antidote to fear and violence is love. Let us now hear the words of John. Beloved, let us love one another because love is from God. Everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. Whoever does not love does not know God, for God is love. God's love was a revealed among us in this way. God sent his only son into the world so that we might live through him. In this is love, not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the atoning sacrifice for our sins. Beloved, since God loved us so much, we also ought to love one another. No one has ever seen God if we love one another. God lives in us and his love is perfected in us. There is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear. For fear has to do with punishment, and whoever fears has not reached perfection in love. We love because God first loved us. Those who say, I love God and hate their brothers or sisters are liars. For those who do not love a brother or sister whom they have seen cannot love God whom they have not seen. The commandment we have from God is this. Those who love God must love their brothers and sisters also. May God's blessing be upon the reading, hearing, and heeding of these holy words. Amen. Good morning, everyone. My name is Lisa, and I am going to be leading the step sitters portion of our morning service this morning. So I want to take the opportunity and invite all the children, um, young people, even grown-ups who are young at heart to gather around the screen. Come on in. Um, and this week I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, mindfulness practice that we can do when we're feeling like we need to calm our thoughts and our bodies a little bit. Um, so have you ever felt like your body has really busy thoughts or your head has really um, busy thoughts, maybe thoughts you might even feel worried or nervous about. Um, that's what we're going to talk about today, about how we can make those feel better. Um, I'm going to give you three things that you can do when you're feeling busy in your body or in your, in your head, in your thoughts. So the first one is if you're ever feeling like your breathing is getting uncomfortable or, or if you're feeling unsure about things in a new or different situation, um, you can take your hand and place it right up here by your chest, by your heart, or by your throat, right up here, and just keeping that warmth and that comfortable feeling of your hand right there by the collarbone, right up there, it helps the body settle down. So during this time that we're finding ourselves in, whether it's that we're starting school soon and school looks different than it did before, or we're having to get used to wearing masks on our faces to protect others um, when we're near people, sometimes we might feel 
uncomfortable or tight in our bodies and just keeping your hand right here for just maybe a few breaths makes a really big difference to help the body calm down and then we feel a little bit more settled when we're dealing with something that feels new or or different and then this other one number two um, Reverend Julie had suggested that I share this with all of you we share this with a grown-up group and a lot of people seem to like it, it might seem kind of silly but have you ever felt like your thoughts are just busy and you, you don't know where they're going or you just have so many and they're coming really fast so it might seem silly but try this with me grown-ups too. take one hand and place it gently on your forehead and one hand at the back of your head and just give that your forehead a really gentle hug and so while you're here in this position it's almost like you're giving your thoughts a really big hug and you're saying it's okay it's okay to have busy thoughts it's okay to be unsure of new situations or something that feels really different than it might have before so these two these two choices when our body feels really busy and heightened or tense when something feels new you put your hand right here and take a few breaths let's take five breaths together ready breathe in For me, that helps me feel a lot more calm and at peace in my body when I use my breathing and that feeling right up here with my hand. And when my thoughts get really busy and really full, not squeezing, just nice and soft, like you're giving your thoughts a hug and you're saying to yourself that it's perfectly okay that you have busy thoughts. And you're just giving yourself a little soft, gentle hug between your forehead and the back of their head. Nice and soft. It might seem kind of silly, but I bet it feels kind of good. And that third way that I like to think about um, what I can do with my hands, sometimes Pastor Kent talks about when we pray, making our hands like a bowl and kind of putting our thoughts and our um, our hopes and our communications um, or our prayers to God in our hands and I really like that I really like having my hands in a bowl and using my hands because when I'm out and about in the world and I don't have anything but my own self I can put my hand on my heart or on my throat I can put my hands at my forehead or I can make a little bowl with my hands and one other way if the bowl, if you if you like the bowl, but you really like that feeling of a hug, is you can hold those hands together in a prayer, in like this little prayer position. Some people like to do it this way and put it up close to their bodies. And some people like to weave those fingers together and hold a little prayer hug with your hands. And for me, not only does it feel good, because it kind of reminds me that I'm I can talk to God anytime that I need to or anytime I want to but it also helps me kind of put all my thoughts and all my worries or all the things that might feel new and different and unsure in my hands think about it just put them there and then hold them together nice and soft you don't have to squeeze real tight just nice and soft and the same way that it felt like I was giving my thoughts a hug when I put my hands on my head it feels to me by doing this that God is giving my thoughts and my worries or my uncertain feelings my busy feelings that God's giving myself a little hug he's gonna hold 
all those thoughts and those things that I might pray or things that maybe I don't even have the words to say. Um, so it's not, it's, it's that like I'm inviting God to be here with me when I do this in a prayer. So there's three things. Let's do them again. Ready? Hand to heart or throat. You can put them on your heart too. I like it right up by my neck. Hands gentle to forehead and the back of the head. And you can pray this way too. You don't have to put your hands in a prayer to pray. You can talk to God like this or any time that you want. But then also hands either in a prayer or weave them together. And imagine that you're going to talk to God and you're going to ask God to hug and hold all those thoughts that you might have that you want to pray or that you're looking to feel more calm because we remember that God is with us all the time. So I'm going to ask you, or I'm going to invite you to pray with me. And you can do any of those hands that you want. You can make a bowl. I really like that one too. But just, just pray with me here. I'm going to put my hands together with my, my thumbs up close to my body. Dear God, thank you for always being with me. When I'm feeling scared or nervous or unsure about things. Thank you for reminding us, God, that your perfect love is in us and with us all the time. And that we can find you here and call upon you in moments of peace that we create or quiet, in moments of mindfulness, and in moments of prayer. Help us to remember that your love for us is with us in everything we do. Can we send those thoughts all together? In Jesus' name, amen. As we enter into this time of prayer this morning, I want to invite you to get comfortable in whatever space you are in. As I think about the ways that when we pray, particularly, we are mindful of the ways that God is everywhere, that God is expansive and robust, that God is not entrapped in the walls of sanctuaries of church buildings, but is everywhere. And so wherever it is that you feel most connected to God, it is my hope that you will find time and space to be in those places this day or in the coming days of the week. For me, being by the ocean is one of those places where I feel incredibly connected to creation and to our God. And so I share that with you this day. If this for you too is a place where you can feel at peace and at rest and at prayer. As we prepare to come into this time, I want to share with you a few prayer requests from our church family. This is a communion Sunday, and so you can think of these as part of our celebrations and concerns that we are typically accustomed to getting to share as we gather around the table. And today it will be gathering around a virtual table. I also want to remind everyone that Kent and I both welcome hearing from you with your prayer requests at any time. You can reach us by email, of course, and request that we share a prayer request with our church family. We also are working to add a virtual prayer card to our website. And so you can watch for that in the coming days ahead. And that will be yet another way for you to share with us and to let us know if there are prayers on your heart that we can share with our church. Today, I want to share with you a request that we hold Evelyn Whiteman in our hearts and in our prayers at this time, as Evelyn is continuing to undergo some medical treatment and testing and diagnoses following a fall, which has precipitated some other medical processes for her. She's currently at Essex Park, and so she can't have visitors easily at this time, but Evelyn would love to be in your prayers. And also she can receive cards and notes. You can send them to her at Essex Park or even phone calls, and you can reach her just through the main desk there. I also want to share a prayer request for Mina Tejwani as she too is in the process of undergoing some medical diagnoses and receiving information about next steps for some different treatments. 
and she too would welcome your prayers and we hold her in our heart. Finally, I want to share with you an announcement that was sent to us and asked that we would share it by our friend and former inter interim minister, Rick Harris. And so I share with you using Rick's words this day. Recently, Rick Harris was diagnosed with cancer. After many doctor's appointments and tests, he will begin a six week regimen of daily weekday radiation therapy and chemotherapy that enhances the, effective of the, the effectiveness of the radiation treatment. Following that, he will be in a period of recuperation and strengthening for anticipated surgery by the end of the year. The prognosis is good and the medical team is among the best in the world for this cancer. We are blessed to be in this medical environment. Although this has been and continues to be a difficult time for Rick and for Anne, they appreciate your prayers and support during these next four months. The surgeon said to Rick that the procedure, which he developed and is used by surgeons all over the world for this type of cancer, has quite a good prognosis, around 89% long-term survival rate, and also indicated to Rick that he anticipates that for Rick it will be 100%. So for Rick and Anne and their daughter Erica, as they too navigate this difficult and uncertain time, we ask for prayers and hold them in our heart. So now let us come bringing those prayers and all the prayers of your hearts and all the prayers that are happening in your life. Let us bring all of those together as we join ourselves in a time of prayer. Let us pray. Loving God, creator of the universe who is always with us, with us on every step of our journey. We ask that you would draw near to us in this time. Draw near to us as we prepare to share in your communion meal. Draw near to us as we prepare to gather around your virtual table, this big expansive table that is closed to none. And allow us to feel your spirit and your presence. Allow us to feel you moving in our midst. Allow your presence and our collective prayers to be felt by all those in our church family who most need them. For Evelyn, for Mina, for Rick, for Anne, and also for all those in our community that we hold in our hearts, may they feel your tender touch, your loving presence, and the strength of our community with them. We give you thanks, O oh God, for a community that is so expansive that no matter where we are, we remain connected at heart and in prayer for one another. We give you thanks for this world that we share. Thanks for the wonder of creation. Thanks for the ways that you are ever present to us. And thank you too for the stories of our faith, the stories of Jesus, the story of love so great that it can cast out any fear the story that brings us together for this time around the table now. And it is in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. Everybody's afraid of something. What are you afraid of? 
What is it that awakens you at three in the morning and you are working your worry beads and you can't let go of? I know there are things that awaken me at three in the morning, things I worry over. Fear is part of the human condition. And that was certainly true at the time that the writer of 1 John was, was writing his letter. He was writing to a fledgling Christian community that had a lot to be fearful of. That early community was a disparate, diverse group of people, and it was hard to find at times what they had in common. Sometimes they focused on their differences rather than their commonality. Some were coming out of the Jewish tradition, and increasingly within the, their own Jewish tradition, they were seen as heretics. Others were coming to the Christian community, followers of Jesus, from other faith traditions and from other cultures and different languages and different races. And the Roman Empire saw this growing, disparate, diverse group of people, and they became afraid. They didn't understand it, and we often fear what we don't understand, right? The Roman Empire didn't understand this Christian community, and they came down like a sledgehammer. And so, this unlikely mix of people, struggling to find what they had in common and whether it was enough to hold them together, it was into this context that John wrote. He shared these words in verse seven. Beloved, let us love one another because love is from God and everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. And whoever does not love does not know God for God is love. This is the glue John was saying that can hold you together. It's as simple as that, says John, this love that will bring this diverse group of people together. Focus on this and you'll be okay. And we can imagine the hearers of John's words looking at one another and saying, is it really that simple? And we ask ourselves in the midst of our own fearful time, is it really that simple? We're living in the midst of a pandemic. We are all affected by it. We worry over our own health and the health of our loved ones. And we see the disparity of well-being within our nation that this pandemic has laid bare. How people of color are suffering because of the pandemic in, in our healthcare system. And we see this rise of racism in our awareness of racism in our nation. And we, we see the divisions being laid bare. And we ask ourselves, is there enough to hold us together? And during this political season, we have some who play the fear card, who focus on our divisions rather than our commonality. Fear is real. And it's always been that way. Forty years ago, William Stafford, the poet laureate, wrote this poem entitled Learning. And it has to do with fear and the role of fear in the public arena. And this is what he writes, learning. A piccolo played, then a drum. Feet began to come, a part of the music. Here came a horse, clippity-clop, away. My mother said, don't run. The army is after someone else other than us. If you stay, you'll learn our enemy. Then he came, the speaker. He stood in the square. He told us who to hate. I watched my mother's face. It's quiet. That's him, she said. Fear is part of the human condition. And some seek to play up that fear. Fear has the capacity to clench us and to limit our imagination and to limit our generosity and to limit our compassion. With the earliers, with the early followers of Jesus, we ask ourselves, is it really 
that simple? Is the answer really found in love? Is that answer enough? In verse 18 through 19, John offers these words, There is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear. For fear has to do with punishment, and whoever fears has not reached perfection in love. We love because God first loved us. We love because God first loved us. God was the initiator of love, and we are to initiate that love with one another. Do we believe that to be true? The word that for love that John chose, and there were many words for love in the Greek language, the language of the New Testament, the word that John chose is agape. And agape is a unique form of love. It is a love that is initiated not by us, but comes to us by God's Spirit. It is God's Spirit being breathed into your life and into mine. It is God's love, God's agape love, which is, empowers and enables us to do what we can't do under our own power. It is a love that enables us to forgive those who have wounded us and wronged us. It opens the door to restoration and reconciliation. It doesn't mean that we are to be doormats or that we are to forget what has happened to us, but forgiveness is a gift that frees us us from our wounds and allows us to live and to love more freely and love more fully. It is a love that is selfless rather than being self-centered. It is a love that enables us to overcome our fear. In verse 9, we hear these words in John's letter. God's love was revealed among us in this way, that God sent his only son into the world so that we might live through him. And then he closes with this word, this verse in verse 11, which I love so much and which I think encompasses all of the gospel's truth. Beloved, since God loved us so much, we also ought to love one another. To love one another to forgive one another, to see the best in one another, to look for the common ground with one another, to enable us to have our imaginations expanded and our fists unclenched, to become what Martin Luther King called the beloved community, where we focus on not on the color of our skin, but on the content of our character, not on that which divides us or separates us, but on our commonality to bring about healing and hope. It's an invitation to a new way of living and being. It is not a place, a physical place, but it is a place of the heart. What does perfect love look like? when it is embodied in another. In 1987, Oscar Arias was the president of Costa Rica, and he was a president in the midst of a time filled with great unrest throughout the region. And he received the Nobel Peace Prize for brokering peace between two warring factions in Nicaragua, the Contras, who were guerrillas coming out of the mountains of Honduras and fighting the Sandinistas, who were the, the leaders of the nation of Nicaragua of that time. And so Oscar Arias was able to bring together these two warring factions and to broker peace, a peace that would last for decades. But there was a lesser known figure chosen by Oscar Arias, who was essential in bringing about this peace and his name was Gustavo Perajon. And Gustavo Perajon was a pastor, a Baptist pastor and a physician and an American Baptist missionary. And he was chosen by Oscar Arias because he had the trust of both the Contra leaders and the Sandinista leaders of these two warring factions. And so Oscar, Gustavo, Oscar tasked Gustavo Perajon with the task 
of brokering peace. His son, David Parahun, who is now a physician in Nicaragua, told me the story of how he would get in a Jeep with his dad and they would drive into the war zone and he would drop his dad off at the edge of the mountains and his dad would walk alone into the jungle and he would go to a place where the Contra leaders and the Sandinista leaders had agreed to meet and he would literally sit down on the ground with this handful of leaders and he would broker a peace. And he was chosen because in the words of both the Contra leaders and the Sandinista leaders that he was guided by love. And so he brokered a peace that not only ended the civil war, but would allow the Contra guerrillas to return into the mainstream of society and to be embraced as brothers. Could it be that simple to love one another? In 2004, I was in the village of La Pita on the Honduran-Nicaraguan border, and I was with a group building a clinic. And the leaders in that village of La Pita, chosen by the community, were two men, each of whom had fought on opposing sides of the Civil War. One had fought for the Contras, one had fought for the Sandinistas, and each had lost loved ones. One had lost his father in the war. The other had lost his brother and his sister in the war. They had been combatants. They had been enemies. They had lost those dearest to them. But here they were leaders in building a clinic for their community. And after I had a chance to get to know these two men, I asked, how could you overcome so much pain? And one looked at the other and then turned to me and said, have you ever heard this verse in the Bible? Perfect love casts out fear. Sometimes it's that simple. In the mid-century of the last, in the middle part of the last century, Madame Marie Curie, the groundbreaking scientist from, who brought about great change and great hope, said this, nothing in life is to be feared. It is only to be understood. Now is the time to understand more so that we may fear less. Nothing in life is to be feared. It is only to be understood. This is all to say that for our time, as we come to understand this virus of COVID-19, we will overcome it. We will find a vaccine. And as we come to understand systemic racism, how it has shaped the formation of our nation going back 400 years, as we understand how it has been baked into the systems of our time, economic, judicial, health systems, as we as white people come to understand how we have benefited from the system while our neighbors of color have not, then and only then will we be able to be free from fear. Free from fear that ignorance fosters. Free to be able to harness our shared imagination and our shared capacity to bring about good, to bring healing and hope. Perfect love casts out fear, says John. It was true then and it is true now. Nothing in life is to be feared, said Marie Curie. It is only to be understood. As we come to understand our faith, as we come to understand one another, as we come to understand the complexity of this time within which we live, Fear dissipates. It loses its power. Our fists become unclenched. Our hearts expand. John looked upon his fellow travelers, his fellow people of faith, 
he saw their fear and he understood it. And he knew that the glue that would hold them together would be God's love as lived out in the witness and teachings and life of Jesus. And as we learn to live and love in such a way, as we give ourselves over to this ethic of love, we become empowered. We become the hands and the heart and the voice of Christ for this time, for this moment of challenge. Could it be this simple, the people asked themselves when they heard John's words? The answer is yes, which is not to say, is it easy? Of course not. But through the power of God's presence, God's spirit being breathed into you and to me as humble servants, like Gustavo Parajon, we are transformed and we become more than we thought possible. This is the good news. Thanks be to God, and may we each in our own way be a source of healing and hope to one another. We are the ones we've been waiting for. God is at work in us. Thanks be to God, and may God's people say, Amen. Welcome to the table of the Lord. Have you ever felt like an outsider? Have you ever felt like you didn't quite fit in? Know that this table is for you. This table is a table of radical grace, of radical inclusion. It is a table that welcomes you and embraces you with all of your wounds and all of your strengths, with all of your doubts and all of your belief. We hear these words from the Apostle Paul, when he speaks to the church of Corinth about the meaning of these elements. For I received from the Lord what I also handed on to you, that the Lord Jesus on the night when he was betrayed took a loaf of bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body that is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he took the cup also after supper saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. In the breaking of the bread, we are reminded of the brokenness of Jesus upon the cross, who took upon himself all of the violence, all of the apathy, all of the indifference of the human condition and offered all peoples to this very day, the gift of forgiveness and the gift of reconciliation with God. Jesus invites us to love God with our whole heart, soul, and mind, to love our neighbor and to learn to love ourself. This bread is the bread of Jesus' witness and teachings in life that restores us and nourishes us. And so we are invited as we share in this communion ritual to eat of this bread together. And as scripture says, after supper, Jesus took the cup and said, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. This is a covenant of grace. It's been said that there's nothing we can do to make God love us more. We can't earn it. And there's nothing we can do to make God love us less. We can't lose it. Because the nature and the essence of God is to love us. And to teach us and to show us how to love others how to love all of creation, how to love ourself. And so I invite you to join with me and join with this, this gathered community to drink of this cup of grace together.
worship has ended. Rainy days come to us all. Challenges enter our lives. We find ourselves in the midst of the unexpected, such as a pandemic. Yet the promise of our faith is that whatever the circumstances, rain or sun, good health or struggles, that God, the source of all that is good, lasting and true, is always with us. The Apostle Paul said that nothing can separate us from the love of God. And so whatever may keep us awake at night, whatever we are fearful of, we find our assurance in our faith, knowing that God is always with us, simply waiting to be found. So go into your week, go through your life knowing that God is always with us, sometimes even carrying us. And may we be a source of healing and hope and blessing to others. This is the good news. Thanks be to God. And may God's people say, Amen. Shower me with love, and I shower.